you know, I just want to say from the very beginning that I have nothing but love for the Baha'i Faith because it changed my life from that moment. As I said, it opened my eyes to the world. And so what attracted me in this little community of Walla Walla, which was, you know, didn't have a whole lot of diversity, was that there was this little group of people who were very diverse. We had American Indians, blacks, uh, age variety, and they were loving. There was no sense of cliquishness about them. Uh, they were outgoing. They embraced me, uh, made me feel right at home right from the very beginning. And so it was this spirit of attraction that I think is the reason anybody, you know, becomes a Baha'i initially. That first summer, I, I became a Baha'i on the first day of the fast in 1970. A couple of months later, I was on a bus with a bunch of Baha'i youth coming to the Baha'i Temple in Chicago. I never thought I would get to Chicago in my life. And attending that first, that youth conference where Rahia Kanum was, and they filmed It's Just the Beginning, and this spirit of, you know, revolution was going on in uh, America, actually. It, it just felt like a really revolutionary time. and. Um, it reinforced my love for the faith and my activity level in the faith. I went off to college and I became very, very active as a Baha'i. And so from uh, the year uh, February of 95 to, uh, I'm sorry, February of 75 to February of 85, I served in that capacity at the Baha'i National Center. It was a very visible position. I went around, gave conferences. Uh, I developed uh, plays for uh, youth conferences. There was one in Columbus, Ohio. We, uh, Star Wars had come out and we did one called Soul Wars, which was a takeoff on that. It was met with great acclaim. <laughs> People loved it. And uh, that was about the time that uh, it had become known that I was gay and working at the National Center. And I remember there was uh, a dress rehearsal for that show and I was the evil emperor. I was all dressed up in horrible, you know, makeup and stuff and the hood and just very dark. And I remember uh, Dr. Kazem Zadeh, one of the members of the NSA, walked by me and he uh, uttered a, a statement that was dripping with double meaning. Imagine that we've had a creature like you working all these years for us at the Baha'i National Center me in my costume. <laughs> but I took it to mean, oh, you. How did that statement make you feel? Oh, well, it made me just want to, you know, crawl into the floor. Already at that point, I was uh, feeling like I was in a, in a fish tank with everybody looking at me because it had become known that uh, I, I was married and had children trying to live the Baha'i life while I was at the National Center. And uh, when it became known that uh, I had been unfaithful and my ex-wife was asking for a divorce, that, uh, and the reasons why, uh, I felt, you know, very uncomfortable. I felt like, you know, I was persona non gratis. But they didn't fire me. I give them credit for that. They didn't fire me. They let me continue working. and. Uh, I had agreement with uh, my boss that we'd complete my 10 years at the center so that I'd be vested in my uh, pension plan and then it'd be time to go on, which is what I did. I remember um, working with uh, the, the ladies that I called my spiritual mothers in Walla Walla. We would go around and try to find the Baha'is that were on the rolls that weren't active. And we went to this one house in Walla Walla, which was kind of dressed up in, in lace and curtains <laughs> and very nicely painted and everything. And uh, we met the, the people who were living inside who were on the rolls as Baha'is. And I remember as we left, they made the, a comment under their breath, homos. And that was the first time I, I went, wait, uh, they're, you know, my spiritual ideal people who t have, are teaching me about spiritual principles and values 
are um, disparaging these people because they appear to be living a different life. And um, there was another member of our community in Walla Walla who moved to San Francisco and later committed suicide. And these things weren't talked about. Uh, I was pretty naive. So it wasn't until really um, my best friend in the Baha'i faith went off to Haifa to serve as a, uh, you know, a, a year, it turned into two or three years of service, and then went to Pioneer, and then he came back and moved to Chicago, and he came out, uh, that I started to think, ooh, you know, I, I really resonate with this, and uh, I had had some gay experiences before I got married, but I tried to just sweep those under the rug as I'd been taught, you know, from a child, you don't talk about things like that, and uh, so, um, you know, the, the, I tried my best to live the teachings as they were presented to me, marriage between a man and a woman. I thought, well, maybe I'm just a sexual being and I need a sexual outlet and I'll be okay if I get married. But um, I don't believe you can suppress your inner nature. I don't believe it's healthy for you and uh, it wasn't healthy for me. I was falling apart. and. Uh, so, uh, as the natural expression occurred, then I was brought into a room at the National Center, I remember, and uh, a representative of the NSA sat me down to inform me that my rights had been removed. And this was like the world had collapsed in front of my eyes because my family, my social, and my work structure Every part of my being was connected with the Baha'i faith and it was like it had all been just destroyed. And I remember looking at her and saying, because I'm thinking about the future, and I said, um, does this mean that in the future if I ever choose to cohabitate with another man, it will be considered a violation of Baha'i law because you know I'm gay? And I just remember the, the stunning blow of her uh, affirmative response to that. Yes, now that we know you're gay, you can never live with another man because it will be assumed that you are violating Baha'i law if you wish to you know, get your rights back. So I just saw it as a death sentence. And um, I don't believe that the human being was designed to live a solitary life. You know, I believe that humans were designed to develop close bonds of affection and uh, that it is an important, you know, what the sexual, you know, details of that are. We are designed to be together. And I'm very fortunate to have met someone that uh, I've been with for 23 years now. And, and uh, it's just been a, a wonderful life. I've been fortunate, uh, as the Baha'i Faith introduced me to the world, to start a, a travel company where I, I take gay people around the world. And uh, they often ask me about how my journey in life, and I can't do anything but include the Baha'i chapter because it was such a formational uh, chapter of my life. And so, um, you know, they also ask me, well, are you a Baha'i? And in my heart, I will always uphold love, respect what I have taken from uh, my association with the Baha'i faith and what I have learned. And uh, it's been nothing but positive. But with any great love affair, there's always tragedy and sorrow too. And so this sorrowful, you know, part has made it uh, pretty much impossible for me to uh, assert that yes, I am a Baha'i because the Baha'is are excluding from full participation in the community life a uh, broad and diverse element of the human uh, garden, you know, the garden of diversity, which is the, the gay people, transgender people, um, lesbians, you know, just so many uh, 
uh, manifestations of human brilliance that are uh, us homosexuals. And um, so I've, you know, taken what I, I could from the Baha'i religion and uh, incorporated it into my life. I try to live the principles and uh, I try to, you know, spread that word about, you know, this is one in fact, when you go to my uh, business Facebook page, <laughs> the first quote is, the earth is but one country and mankind is its citizens. And that's what I believe and that's why I take uh, people in, from my tribe, the gay tribe, around the world to experience all the, the wonders that the world has to offer. And I believe it's through interactions with different cultures that we grow and we change. And uh, it's a two-way street. We change ourselves and the people we come in contact with change. And unfortunately, because the Baha'i community has excluded us from that close interaction with them, we're not a part of the community, they haven't had the benefit of the positive changes that could come as a result of the close association with people like me who are creative you know, and uh, who get things done. If the, uh, the promise of the Baha'i Faith to unite the world is to happen, it cannot happen if there is this one segment of humanity which is prohibited from full participation. And I don't care how it is dressed up, <laughs> in flowery language from the Universal House of Justice as being a false dichotomy or, you know, anything like that. It is plain and simple wrong to attribute to this one group of people a lesser status and an inability to, uh, to participate fully. So, um, the, the words that we accept all, that we treasure the diversity of the human family and the, in all its glory, fall a little flat when there is this one element of the human family that is uh, disenfranchised. And it's just plain, we cannot participate now. And uh, this is all because of a very allegorical and abstruse sentence in the Kitabi Akdas by Baha'u'llah about the subject of boys. It isn't clear, except in my mind it means, you know, pederasty, but then there's this one underlined word in the uh, Guardian's notes about, as he was preparing the codification of the Akdas, homosexuality underlined next to that comment. And now, we cannot, for the next thousand years, well, 800 or 850 now, <laughs> we can never have that change. So many countries are affirming the rights of gays and lesbians, and it's, it's a tribute to the ability of the human being to think with his own mind and see with his own eyes what is true. And I appeal and hope that the Baha'is will, as a result of this documentary, ask themselves, is this the way the world is moving? And if we are moving, or not moving <laughs> at all, we're stuck, how can we fulfill the promise that uh, the Baha'i faith is founded on of uniting all? I will be forever grateful to the Baha'i Faith for forcing me in one way to, uh, to go outside my comfort zone and get married. And as a result of that, uh, having two wonderful children who are the light of my life, I now have two grandsons as well, and uh, I would not uh, have this element of uh, the human 
you know, experience probably if I had uh, followed probably what my heart was saying back then and just uh, said no to uh, the possibility of uh, a relationship with a woman. Uh, we're still good friends and uh, we are a, a um, very uh, new age family. But when my partner and I celebrated our uh, official marriage recently, my children came, my two grandsons were here, and my ex-wife was here. And we, I gave a tribute at that time to the Baha'i marriage vow that we will all verily abide by the will of God. And that's what we're doing right now. We're abiding, abiding by the will of God. And in my life, the will of God is to be true to myself and to live a full life that includes um, the, the partner of my choosing. I really love and am so grateful for the exposure to diversity that I received growing up in the Baha'i faith and um, being taught from an early age to celebrate diversity and getting access to all the Baha'i teachings and just having so much more knowledge than pretty much everyone I was growing up with my age about um, what we actually need to do as a society to evolve into who we really are as one race and um, to celebrate what makes us unique rather than to look at it as ways and reasons to separate ourselves. And I especially loved the, the teachings about the equality of men and women, and that's something that's very important to me. I loved being active in the Baha'i Youth Workshop. It was something, um, it was really good for me in those ages that I was involved, some like, something like between the ages of 13 and um, 16, I think. I was very active in the Chicago Baha'i Youth Workshop and the, um, the Baha'i Youth Workshop in Dallas, Texas. And I loved just being out there, like promoting these values of elimination of all forms of prejudice and um, the equality of all the races and the sexes and um, the what we need to do to eliminate extremes of wealth and poverty. Like these are all issues that I'm, I love and I felt so good about bringing this into the, the public schools and interacting with inner city children and bringing this message of positivity and unity, especially in Chicago, where there is such a history of division among the races and um, so much uh, racism steeped into even how the city was built and laid out and structured by uh, neighborhood. So that was super rewarding. So one of the, the hardest things for me growing up as Baha'i was seeing this happen among all of my friends, knowing just how many Baha'i youth and adults were actually having sex and involved in sexual relationships with each other and absolutely no repercussions. While at the same time, my own father, who was super passionate about the Baha'i faith, and devoted much of his life in service to the cause, actually lost his Baha'i voting rights and could not go to feast, could not participate in electing people to the LSA, and um, didn't even feel good about coming around Baha'is and coming to Baha'i events that he could, did have the rights to go to because he felt so excluded. And this is all because he said, I will not agree to um, never again share a, a dwelling space with someone of the same sex as me. Once the LSA and NSA found out that he was gay. So it, it felt very hypocritical to me. My mom would share things with me about um, how uh, homosexuality is not allowed in the Baha'i faith and it's considered a spiritual sickness. And once my father did come out to my brother and I, when we were still children, um, she would speak to me openly about that your, your father is sick. He has a spiritual sickness and he's going to 
therapy and he's going to try to heal from this spiritual sickness. And I just said, Dad, I love you exactly the same. It does not matter to me at all. And that is how I have felt. That's how I've always felt. And nothing has changed there. I do not identify as a Baha'i. I haven't identified as a Baha'i for something like 15 years now. Um, for me, that has been in large part due to the Baha'i stance on homosexuality. Um, I can't support something, no matter how gorgeous all of its other teachings are, that says that my father is in any way sick or an abomination because of how he was created. Still to this day, even without identifying as a Baha'i, when things come up around racial issues, I fall back on that body of knowledge that I learned in the faith. And when tensions arise, I go back to what I learned about consultation. And there's so much richness in what I did learn that will always be a part of me. And yet I, I, I let people know even when I'm sharing the faith with them. And they're like, that's amazing. I love hearing this. Oh my gosh, it's kind of, it's all making sense. Like all the light bulbs are going off, like progressive revelation, one God, all the messengers and prophets come from that same God. And I'm like, yeah, it's really amazing, isn't it? And I personally don't identify as a Baha'i because they teach that homosexuality is a spiritual sickness and um, incur uh, there's a law that says no sex before marriage. And I personally am much more for sexual expression and healthy sexual expression and um, ensuring that people have the knowledge and the tools and the wisdom that they need to make their decisions for themselves based on how it feels in their own body. And so that's how I live my life today, is using my own heart and my own moral compass and what feels congruent to guide and direct me, rather than looking to a set of laws and teachings as to how I should and should not live my life. And be a voice for the oneness of all people and the unity of humankind. And it is this one single writing in the Kitab i Akdas, which has a questionable translation that could mean homosexuality and could also mean the practice of pedophilia, that is causing the Baha'i faith to hold back its love and support for my father during this time and for any other human rights abuse that involves gay people. And um, so I, I really do think and feel that in the future, um, Baha'is will look back at this time with regret and remorse and sadness and shame that they weren't at the forefront where Baha'u'llah would want them to be of all human rights causes. There were many occasions that I would find myself in Chicago visiting my dad and I would want to go to the temple together. And I would invite my dad to go to the temple with me or, I or my mom was coming into town and we would be going to the temple together and we'd want my dad to come. And uh, there were many occasions that I was sitting in Foundation Hall watching the videos that my dad had helped to make when he was working at the treasurer's office about the Baha'i Temple being built in India and just feeling so much pride um, that my dad had contributed in this way and had been of service and gone above and beyond to help create these videos. And then just the sadness that my dad felt um, so much grief and sadness around the way that he was pushed out of the community that he was so actively a part of and that was such a huge part of his life that he would he would decline and he wouldn't come with me to the temple and he he didn't feel comfortable because it brought up too much emotion and that was heartbreaking for me well of course, I'm super grateful that my dad <laughs> chose the path exactly the way that he chose it so that I could be in this body on this planet talking to you right now. And at the same time, I do feel really sad 
when I reflect on my dad's life and that he felt the need to hide a huge part of who he is to fit in and belong with a group that he wanted to be a part of and to participate in something he believed strongly in. And Dan, how does that make you feel? Oh, I'm so proud of this young lady. She's just the light of my life. And uh, uh, I, I know from the pain that I caused as um, a parent who was going through such a big upheaval, you know, the, the lasting, you know, emotional impact that it had on, on my daughter and my son and my ex-wife. This is something that I have to live with for all my life but I continue to grow as a spiritual person and continue to change and to repair and to show in action that I am not the same person that I was back then and that I do care deeply about the family that I helped to bring into this world. Thank you for being here. Yeah, and I would say as as hard as some of those early childhood experiences were of going through separation and year of patience and divorce when I was, you know, three or four years old, it did shape largely who I am today and is a big part of why I'm so passionate about working with other people in the healing profession and supporting others in restructuring and rewiring their own beliefs about themselves that got programmed when they were about that age. So I have no regrets about the way that our family trajectory has gone. Thank you. Mm.